From Chicago's CAN TV, this is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome to Chicago Newsroom right here on CAN TV. I'm Ken Davis, back for another week of conversation about the city that we all love to sit around and talk about. On today's show, how can an entire town, a city of maybe 23,000 people, essentially collapse over about 20 years? Well, you can make the argument that a once thriving suburb that sits right on the border of Chicago did just that when thousands of well-paying jobs in steel and manufacturing vanished almost overnight and suddenly housing values began to tank and people began moving away and people with fewer resources moved in and tax scavengers and real estate speculators started converting the houses to rentals. It's an incredibly sad story, and it's told in brilliant detail in a recent BGA and WBEZ collaboration. It's called American Suburb 2018, Stories and Photos from Dalton, Illinois. And I'm very pleased to welcome BGA investigator Casey Toner and WBEZ reporter Miles Bryan. I'm just such an admirer of the work that you did, and I apologize that it's taken us a couple of weeks to be able to fit you into the schedule here because the story's been out for a few weeks, but welcome to the show, you guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, the, 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 the quote was, it's close enough to the city for industry and far enough away for good, clean suburban living. Let's yeah. start there. Well, that's a quote that I found when I was digging through the archives at the Dalton Library. Because mm -hmm. I wanted to know, you know, what happened to this town? Because yeah. you go there now and it's kind of worn out and there's hundreds of abandoned homes and has these crazy high property taxes. But at one point in time, you know, Dalton was the picture of the suburban dream mm -hmm. that over the decades has slowly faded away. Yeah, yeah. And it's as, as you say it, it, it's all of these interlocking pieces that I hope we're going to be able to kind of discuss in some detail today um, but the first thing that happens is it's just the collapse of jobs I mean it, that happened that happened all over but it seemed to have a much heavier impact here yeah as Casey was saying I mean Dalton's this place that that epitomized in a lot of ways the suburban dream. And it did for like a couple of groups of people, which is interesting. So like you said, this was a place that was maintained by industry jobs, by mm -hmm. steel jobs for many years. And the first, the reason it sort of rose to prominence originally in the, the 50s and 60s and 70s was when basically white people left the south side of Chicago, a lot of them fleeing African-American people moving into the south side of Chicago. Mm -hmm and went to Dalton. And it was a place where you could have you sort of leave it to Beaver community and people could work these decent jobs that didn't take that much education and, and make good money. Yeah. And then the steel industry started to collapse in that whole region. Um, and that was a big part of why that original group of folks, those who could leave, started to leave. Yeah, yeah. But I think what really struck me, what, something I found very interesting was, as this was happening, Dalton becomes the site of the suburban dream for a new group of people, right. which is African American homeowners right. Right. in Chicago who also want to get out of the city. And they start Same moving thing. to Dalton. They want out in they, the 80s and, and 90s. Right. And here's this beautiful place that they can go to. And, and I mean, I don't really know. Uh, I, I was going to look up some of the history of the, the earlier history of Dalton, but I mean, it looks like Dalton's history kind of begins in post -war, post war, right? I mean, all those houses look like they're all mid century houses, pr practically everything. Yeah, the population in Dalton like tripled from 1940 to 1970. And that's where it really took off. Mm -hmm. It's been around for more than 100 years. And mm -hmm. it kind of started as one of these kind of sleepy railway, railway towns. Yeah. But it wasn't until the World, uh, the World War, the Second World War began, mm -hmm. that the town really took off. That uh, all of these like little satellite manufacturers popped up in yeah. town, like yeah. an aluminum factory, a steel factory, a container factory. And now they're all gone. Yeah. All those jobs that were with them were gone. Yeah. And, th and that financial underpinning that, that, that kept Dalton uh, as this, you know, place to be for homeowners uh, that also left. Yeah. You know, there's something I, w I want to get on the table before we even really get too deep into this. One of the things that I really admire about your piece, and, and we should actually put it up on the screen how to get to it. It's at, it's at bgabettergov.org, and your stories are at wbez.org. Um, I really like the fact that you didn't make it predominantly a story about race that it's predominantly a story about economics, but race is overlaid across yeah. it. And it would be too easy to just say, this is a story about, you know, a bunch of white people move in and then they move away and black people move in and the town crashes. 
this is a story about disinvestment. It's a story about, about the labor economy and how I see it more as a kind of a musical chair story. It's like, where were you when the music stopped? And that's, that's the story. I, I mean, I don't think you can separate race out entirely. I mean, it, it, to me, it's a story where, where race is fundamentally, like, race, race and economics are inseparable mm -hmm. in trying to figure out what happened to this right, place. Right. But I think you're right broadly in the sense that something we thought a lot about reporting this is Dalton has this specific story of decline, and that story sort of is part of a broader story of the region. But if you look at the whole country, uh, poverty has been growing in mm -hmm. suburbs like mm -hmm. Dalton mm -hmm. at a much faster rate than the rest of the country. In fact, there's more poor people who live in suburbs now than in than in the city, than in places that you might traditionally associate with poverty, like the inner city. Mm -hmm. And even just as an interesting tidbit, as the, the economy is doing well, right? It's, uh, poverty is falling across the country. That's largely driven by places like Chicago and installed in suburbs like Dalton. Yeah. So there's an even bigger story in terms yeah. of how do we think about these places that have ended up being the home of a lot of our most hard up citizens that, that aren't finding their footing. Right. And there's a phrase that, that I like. It's, it's called, all the pieces matter. You know, mm -hmm, you have to look mm -hmm. at the whole of everything. And the genesis of the story began um, earlier this year when we published a series about suburban police shootings. Yes, and, yeah. And we saw that um, in, in Dalton and in Harvey, which is right next door, over the past 12 years, there were 18 police shootings. And in that little area, or five or six suburbs, it was like 40% of all the police shootings. Uh, took place there in the past 12 years. And we started wondering, you know, what happened at this town? Like, like yeah. why is this happening? What's going on? And we went from there. Mm -hmm. I, that, that is, <laughs> as, as so often happens at our table, we find this, this conversation, like you're saying, where all the pieces matter. Because if you take any one piece out of it, if you, take, if you just pull one piece out, the whole thing begins to collapse. You talk about schools, you talk about race, you talk about services, taxes, all of these right. issues. And every single one of them is, leads, to, leads from the other. But I'm, I'm so fascinated about what happens to just an individual house. And, and you, you do that with, um, oh, his name just escaped me, Courtney, Courtney Jones. Jones, right? Courtney Jones, mm -hmm. where you actually tell the story of one guy and what happened there. But initially, the people who, who lose these jobs they are they are largely the white people, and they have at least the resources to make one more leap, right? They can jump. They jump from the city into into Dalton. They can afford to go somewhere else. I don't know where they're going, yeah. but they can afford to go somewhere else. The black people who move in, who are echoing exactly what they did in 1964 or whenever it was, get caught. They get caught in the switches because everything else, because the other pieces are falling apart. I mean, you, you see so much reporting now. It's been 10 years since the housing crisis, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, there's been a lot of stories. Oh, home values have largely recovered. You know, people are building equity back in their homes. And in these communities, that's just not the case. Yeah. I mean, the housing crisis pulled the rug out for just so many thousands of families, largely black families, who mm -hmm. had made a stake in these suburbs. And these were places where you could buy a starter home and it would build mm -hmm. some equity. And then you could move up to a bigger home. And that has just never really returned. And it's, it's, you know, it's a problem that lots of places, more far-flung places, farther out from jobs and opportunity, mm -hmm. have still faced. I mean, that you can't, like, when you, when you don't have that equity in your home and you can't leave and you're stuck, there's just this sense of despair mm -hmm. and, like, checked out, a sense of being checked out that builds up. And it's just like, what do you, what do, you do about that? Yeah. And again, going down that road a little bit, what happens is you're stuck with this house, the value of it is lost by 50%, but your taxes are not going down. Your taxes are going up because the poor municipality is trying desperately to raise enough money to keep the police employed. So your taxes go to the point where you can't pay them and then that moment happens, that first moment happens when you get a tax bill and you can't pay the whole bill. And then what happens? And then someone else buys the taxes. And these companies come in and they buy the taxes. And um, what happens is if you don't pay these companies back, often with enormous interest, you can lose your house. Yeah. Um, and that happens only a small percentage of the time. 
Um, but, but what is happening is that there are all these people that are struggling to pay their enormous tax bills. And on top of this, they have to pay this extra interest to these companies. And, um, you know, these interest payments can be thousands of dollars uh, mm -hmm. when, when they're all stacked up at the very end. And, you know, it's just a part of this problem of, the, of these taxes in these towns where uh, in the village of Dalton, the average property tax rate is three times higher than the average property tax rate is in Chicago. It's and amazing. That's, that's right across it's the board. You've got tons of Chicagoans complaining yeah. all yeah. the time. Right. We, we, we all, we all, it's our favorite sports yeah. to complain about our taxes, yeah. right? Oh yeah, well, what, how'd you like to move to Dalton where it would triple? <laughs> and he, I think like if you pull back a little bit, I mean, and think about this in terms of how you're dealing with these big social problems and how that's different in the city versus suburbs like Dalton. Like, you know, there are neighborhoods in Chicago, right, that really, really struggle, like, you know, parts of Englewood or something. But there's also these big philanthropic associations. There's, uh, there's you know, anti-poverty programs, the city funds, and there's, this, and there's also just a huge commercial tax base that can pay for a lot of stuff. You got all these poor folks now in places like Dalton and Calumet City and Markham. And these village, their, their, their village administrations are often struggling to just keep their head above water, or they're, they're, they're squabbling, you know, they're maybe making some decisions that could use greater scrutiny. Yeah. And they're not coming together to try and figure these things out on a, on a kind of a bigger yeah. level. And it's just this like this fracturing of how to deal with poverty that, that, that's happening in the suburbs. It makes it really hard to see and how to and deal with. <sighs> A major piece of this, I think, is that so many suburbs um, really just don't have much. We always refer to them as bedroom suburbs, right? Bedroom communities. They're just a bunch of houses and a few other buildings and stuff. I was having a really interesting conversation over the weekend with some friends of mine in Evanston talking about Evanston. Now, Evanston is not Dalton and is not in any way like Dalton, but yet it has some of the same problems because here's this what you would consider to be wealthy, well-to-do suburb, but it's got nothing except taxes, except house, uh, what am I, uh, property taxes, because it doesn't have a giant shopping center, it doesn't have any factories or anything like that. So in a, in a strange way, the same problem is happening there. They're running up against having to close some police stations or, or fire stations or something because they just don't have enough tax base and they're taxed to the max and everything else. This is one of the problems of suburbanization, that, that we created these pockets of towns that don't have a diverse enough economy of their own. And this is, this is what we're seeing now is the extreme of what happens when one kind of yeah. just crashes. And you look at, I mean, you look at the way that the economy's going. I mean, this is a bit of a leap, but if you look at like Amazon's decision to locate its, head, its headquarters in New York City and the DC area, two of the richest, most job rich, most expensive, mm -hmm. most housing scarce parts of the country. I mean, you sort of have this increasing concentration of wealth and opportunity yeah. in these places, but then you have all these people who still live in the suburbs and you have all these villages and towns. Mm -hmm. it, essentially, it's at, one, it's at a certain point, it's like, what do you do with them? You know, yeah. how, do you, how do they survive? What's right. the future for this sort of place? Mm -hmm. And, and I've received a lot of feedback from people after the story ran. People that live in these suburbs who mm -hmm. say, look, you know, I lived in this town and, you know, when I first moved here, things were going really great. But recently we've outsourced our fire department mm -hmm. to some mm -hmm. other village, which is also struggling and things are just falling apart. And mm -hmm. these resources that are available in the city, you know, just aren't there in these suburbs that are hard to get to, that are far away, right. um, and that are just lacking um, in, in resources to deal with these enormous problems. And, sc and scrutiny. I mean, uh, we ran into a school superintendent of, of one of the districts out there who had told me, I believe, that she had not been visited by a reporter since 2009. Hmm. I, I, she <laughs> was just thanking us. I mean, we were asking hard <laughs> yeah. questions. Yeah. Sad questions. Why are so many of your teachers absent all the time? Mm -hmm. But she was like, thank you for, for coming by because nobody pays attention to us. Nobody knows what's going on out here. You know, and I mean, that's part of the, that part of that story is linked to the, the, the struggle that journalists, the struggle of journalism, especially in smaller places. But, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's all part of this bigger cycle. Yeah, it really is. And, and, and it's, it's, um, it's just something about this sort of historical anomaly of how our cities developed with smaller towns around them that then in the mid-century be, became these suburbs that, that 
seemed like they were the uh, utopia for a while and now not so much. Yeah, and the, the Great Recession just had this enormous effect mm -hmm. on, on these communities. Um, the housing market especially was just devastated. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to a, an academic at UIC, and one of the things she told me that stuck in my mind is that um, the people that can move do. Mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so there's all these people in Dalton that bought yeah. these houses. And when that recession hit, the value of their homes has plunged um, by more than 30%. Um, and, and so there's all these houses that are underwater, yeah. and it keeps people kind of locked there. Uh, because if they if they leave, they just take this giant hit mm -hmm. um, on their their home value. And so, just by staying in a town like Dalton, or staying in a town like Cal City, or Harvey, or, or any of these suburbs, people uh, are just losing money. And if they leave, they're also losing money. Um, so it's kind of a lose lose situation mm -hmm. for uh, yeah. some of these struggling residents. But but, but <coughs> excuse me. But conversely, there are still people coming to Dalton from Chicago in this interesting way where there, there are folks who, who still, even for all of its problems, see Dalton as, as somewhere where they can, they can have a better situation than they did in some of the hardest sure. parts of Chicago. I mean, something we encountered really early on is if you talk to folks in these communities and you say, you know, if they've been around for a while, and you say, you know, how's it going? Generally, people say things have gotten worse, right? I mean, that was yeah. almost the entire, entirety of what we got. And then if you say, why? I can't tell you how many times I heard a variation on this answer, which is there's more renters now, mm -hmm. there's more people from the city, mm -hmm. they don't keep, take care of things. And I don't mean to uh, disrespect sort of the, the opinion of folks who live in these communities and have seen this stuff firsthand. Uh, you know, I'm, we're just reporters. But the way I ended up starting to see it is I think there's a sort of force for the trees thing going on where mm. people see the arrival of, of people who are maybe lower income, who are seeking something better, but is but in a in a village that has that has declined economically from when these people that we're talking to arrived, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of decades ago, mm -hmm. and they blame them. But what they're actually seeing is the outcome of a, of this sort of cyclical economic decline, right? And then it and then these tensions have developed at least in Dalton, where it's, it seems like it's hard for people to actually come together over common values and priorities because there ends up being these these squabbles between homeowners and renters. Between, you well, know, I mean, I, th I, I think that's, that's really a critical, uh, again, so many of these pieces. This is another of the critical pieces is when a house just, w when, when the homeowner just loses the house for whatever reason, there's always somebody willing to come in and swoop in and buy that house up and then just rent it. And you can rent it until the house is just no longer habitable and then walk away. And you can make a lot of money being, a, being an absentee landlord. So not everyone is suffering in these places. There are people who are making a good living uh, off of the suffering of, of other people. It's, a, it's kind of a, you know. I, I just wanted to mention that, um, again, just quoting yourselves back to you, but data from the United States Census show Dalton went from having 42 African-American residents in 1970, 42 to 487 by the beginning of the next decade in 1980, 14,000 by 1990, and now it's 21,000, which is more than 90% of the total population. So this was another one of these places where the racial change was just, I mean, really a, almost a blink of an eye. And it, we, as the, the, all the reasons are the reasons that we're talking about here. But nevertheless, a lot of people really got hurt in this. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, you, you can't tell a story without talking a little bit about the white flight that occurred mm -hmm. in the town. Um, you know, we, we talked to this woman, Marlene Cook, who wrote this great history of Dalton called the Dalton Tadler, who described this um, a phenomenon in town where in the, in the 80s and the early 90s, people would put up these signs in their windows that say, we're not leaving. Because yeah. they wanted their neighbors to know that they were there, that they were there for the, yeah. the future of Dalton. Right. And then overnight, they would vanish. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's all these kinds of like weird little stories about this that, that I discovered that are in the story and are not in the story. Um, but, but what happens is you can see as industry in the town declined, um, you know, the white flight just began. Yeah. And it hit a, a critical point where um, you know people just began leaving in mass, yeah. and um, you know there's just been this um, just enormous transition in the town over you know a few decades. That's pretty staggering. Um, that is reminiscent of of what's happened in, in neighborhoods in Chicago too, mm -hmm. but just in the suburbs. But we shouldn't underplay the fact that like this 
this race, this this white flight, which was, you know, racial fear, which was racist. Uh, basically racist thought manifesting and, and people leaving oftentimes that, that hurt the village mm -hmm. I mean that and it mm -hmm. hurt the people arriving and uh, you know it was uh, just sort of entirely problematic in some ways um, and you see you see it in the language of some of the white folks we talked to who would say oh I'm not racist but mm -hmm. these people didn't know how to live in a suburb they mm -hmm. didn't know how to cut their lawn they didn't know how to do their gas their water bill you see some of that language, strangely, coming back up now in some of the homeowners who are almost entirely black talking mm -hmm. about renters. Yeah. And so yeah. it was just something that I thought about a lot, which was how do you, how do you break this cycle mm -hmm. of economic downturn mm -hmm. fueling this, a lot of times, irrational fear yeah. of the, the other, yeah. the new arrival, yeah. well, that, 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 that sends the village into sort of a, a faster downward spiral. Your uh, your piece where where you talked with Courtney Jones um, is is really one of the sadder parts of this because here's a here's a guy who's African American who moves in who has values that are just as <laughs> whatever you want to call it they're just as solid as any of the other people who live there he loved his lawn and loved yeah. the, loved you know keeping his lawn well clipped and everything and then he. Uh, falls victim to, to, to not being able to pay his taxes and so forth. But you're right, there's, there is a, I don't know what that is, is it class or what? But, but there, there's this kind of layering of, of people who look down on the people who come behind yeah. them. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, we did a story, we looked at um, sort of the village politics in a story. We looked at mm -hmm. uh, this, this company that came into town called BP Capital yeah. that kind of promised a quick fix to the the problem of blighted housing and um, and vacant uh, and, uh, peop the homeowners who were not taking care of the property that had definitely some some issues maybe should have been looked at more carefully by the politicians but the politicians are so deep in this sort of the mayor versus the the village board that they're, they're not really able to address these concerns um, and it just the, the, the fact that that uh, the leadership in this village is so it's, it seems to really be failing to rise to the, the problems that they have. It just made me think about, you know. Well, those of us who've been around for a while uh, certainly are familiar with the name the Shaw Brothers. I mean, uh, th th they were they were just legendary in this town in the 80s and 90s, and uh, one of them went on to become mayor. And you know, that alone is probably. 31 percent of the of the story of why the place went to hell and what's something that was interesting we found is that um you know the shaw brothers kind of they rode two different waves of white flight there mm -hmm. was this there's this earlier wave of, of white flight in roseland and they moved um you know from the west side of chicago to the south side because of these changing demographics mm -hmm. and they saw the opportunity um, you know, to get elected and make something of themselves. And so they got elected and then make two something decades for later, themselves, you mean. Yeah. And two decades <laughs> later, two decades later, they showed up again in Dalton. Yeah. You know, just, just down the road yeah. um, when the demographics were changing again. And I think to some extent, um, you know, Bill Shaw, the late Bill Shaw, the mayor, had a lot of clout and he was a state senator and he did bring millions of dollars yeah. to the village of Dalton. Mm -hmm. I mean, his funeral pamphlet um, described him as one who truly brought home the bacon. <laughs> and, and, and you know, the Shaw brothers, they've been accused of corruption. There's certainly elements of their past that, that you're referencing. But I would push back a little bit because, one, they did seem to really bring a lot of uh, money to the village mm -hmm. and kind of keep it afloat. And two, this sort of old school Chicago patronage politics, I mean, the way it would manifest is they would, you know, they would, they would do a lot of community events. They'd drive around and talk to people and see what was going on. If you look at the village leadership now, that doesn't really seem to be the case. I mean, there's this complete atomization of people. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, frankly, mo most of the folks I, I spoke to who hadn't been around for a while, especially some of the renters, I mean, they, had, they didn't, you know, know who the, the mayor was. They weren't that invested or they were unhappy with them. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, seem, it seems to, in some ways, be a, a loss from what the Shaw brothers did. And, and I think there is kind of a through line between, you know, the Shaw brothers and now, and that is, in the government, there is a sense of chaos. 
Um, I mean, reading some of these stories about the Shaw brothers, I mean, it was wild. I mean, they gave, uh, Bill Shaw gave his son like a million dollar contract to renovate this nursing home that's falling apart. And then he didn't pay taxes on it. And he's in prison now for not paying taxes on it. And, you know, there's just chaos at the village board level. And even today, I mean, w I went to a village board meeting and it was wild. I mean, they're, <laughs> like the microphones weren't working because they laid off the guy that yeah. was operating the microphones. Mm -hmm. So the village board members and the mayor were yelling at each other, yelling over at each other. Every once in a while, the police chief would stand up to tell people in the crowd to quiet because they were yelling over, um, you know. a snake? Yeah, there's some lady <laughs> wore some lady wore uh, a necklace that had a snake on it, and then she held it up in front of the village board members and said, I'm wearing this because you guys are snakes. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just one of these things where it's just complete and total dysfunction. I mean, you talk to the village board members long enough, and they will blame the mayor within a few minutes of talking to him. You talk mm -hmm. to the mayor, and within a few minutes of talking to him, he will blame the village board members. And it's just really, really hard to get things together. You know, Miles mentioned earlier this company that was brought in to renovate all these abandoned houses. And, um, you know, there's no bidding. They just kind of gave this company this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And in a community that had more resources, there would be an entire team of people working in the village to evaluate a firm that would do this. Yeah. But in a town like Dalton, they're yeah, just it's left. Just the, the, yeah. Well, I mean, you talk about um, shifts that are running with three police officers for 24,000 person town. I mean, it's, they, they, they can't pay their water bills. They, they just simply don't have money. It, I mean, it's, it's sort of strange as a journalist who wants to sort of deal with facts and with real uh, uh, solid sort of clear questions to, to end up where I ended up. But I feel like I, I, most of what I thought about reporting the story was like community, like capital C community. How do you, how do you create a sense of community again mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. place where it feels like it's all but gone, right, you know, right. where, frankly, most people with any means, it seems like, are more interested in getting getting a piece for them mm -hmm. than right, really right, stepping right. up and dealing with the village's issues. Well, there's, a, there's an interesting sub-question to that, which is whether there ever was a community in the first place. Because, you see, that's one of the things that, that I think sticks out to me about, about places like these, enclaves like these, that they're not necessarily really communities. They're just kind of places where people have gone and they're, they're sort of assembled. But was, I think, the, was I there think really? So. I mean, I think if you talk to African-American homeowners who moved to Dalton in 1996, saved mm -hmm. up money, bought a starter home, the schools weren't amazing even then. But, you know, they were fine. They were pretty good. Yeah. There's a, a strong black homeowning class. Uh, you know, unemployment, there was unemployment, there was poverty, but it wasn't, you know, so it wasn't astronomical. You, I mean, maybe, people, there was a sense of place. And I think that, I think it was the recession and the, the, the loss of that core equity in the uh, home the loss that of pulled scaling. the rug out of that. Yeah, yeah. When, when you take whatever it is, 70% of the, of the good, well-paying jobs out of a community, the community is going to crash. There's just no way around it. Um, um, well, anyway, we 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 we've talked a lot about those about those things. I wanted to wanted to bring up uh, something else, and I I've lost my place in my notes. But anyway, uh, it, David Johnson. I thought that was really interesting. David Johnson, who was Harvey's mayor from uh, Harvey's mayor from 1983 to 95, he said that he saw eight eight thousand good paying jobs disappear from Harvey in two decades, and he said it's quiet devastation that sweeps through the communities. It's not like it's not like a tornado comes through; it happens over time, and it's just this kind of gradual dissolution of things, and that's a, I, that has to be almost impossible to deal with. And, and Harvey, which is right next door to Dalton, has. Yeah even bigger problems. In Harvey, the devastation is worse because it was a manufacturing hub. Mm -hmm. Dalton is more of a satellite, yeah. but Harvey was, was, was an economic engine in the south suburbs. And he's right. It's one of those things where if a tornado came through town mm -hmm. and it just destroyed Harvey and Dalton in a single swoop, I think people would probably care more, get a lot more attention on the news, there would be more interest in yeah. it, and the, probably the feds would come in mm -hmm. rushing. Yeah, but when this right. happens very slowly over mm -hmm. time and there's mm -hmm. thousands of people suffering, um, it just kind of falls out of the limelight a little and bit. I have to say, when we reported this story and put it out, I was thinking, like, how many people are going to click or listen to a story about devastating, suffocating poverty in a place they probably have never heard of? And I was really surprised at how 
much reaction it's gotten. I mean, it's yeah. gotten a lot of views on the internet. I mean, people listened on the radio. Mm -hmm. so a lot of people have reached out to us. And I think this is, you know, I think this issue of, of sort of systemic poverty in these sorts of places, people think about and are worried about it, but, but doesn't get talked about enough because it's really hard to figure out how to talk about it, you know? I, I will say this, a, a great deal of it has to do with the fact that it is very, very well reported and written. I mean, I, I, it, I uh, sat down, I, you know, was in a coffee shop and just started reading it, and 45 minutes later, I'm still sitting there okay. and, and, until, I, until I finished it. It, it, it has, it has a kind of a novel quality to it, that it's just something that you just want, you can't stop turning the page. And it's because it's just such a perfect example of all the things that are wrong in our country, just sort of solidified in one place. It's just, it's really remarkable. You were talking, you, I remember what I was going to ask you about before, you talked about the schools and that in, just in Dalton schools alone, there are hundreds of kids who transferred in from CPS. Yeah. And that was, to me, I, I was like, you know, We've been arguing about this now for about 10 years, about you know where are these African-American children who are leaving the Chicago public schools going? Are they, are they dispersing all over the country? Oh. Well, guess what, folks? It was a couple of miles. They're, they're hundreds going to Dalton. Hundreds and hundreds of people. They're going to, they're going to Indiana. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to a couple other places in the state. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, from our conversations with superintendents, with teachers, with social workers, and with students, it's not like, I mean, Dalton schools were already struggling to deal with rising poverty yeah. and general lack of resources for years before lots of CPS kids started showing up. And they had, and also to be fair, CPS kids have transferred into Dalton probably forever. Mm -hmm. But they were saying, you know, we're already struggling and we, we were struggling to provide for the, the issues that we're now seeing with, with kids, especially from from very poor parts of the city that, that need a lot of resources yeah. um, to, to get a good education. Um, yeah, and it's, it's hard for these places, especially when they're so invisible, you know? Yeah, we yeah. talk a lot about Chicago schools. We don't talk a lot about Dalton schools. Right, it, right. And I, I want to be clear that, you know, the problems in, in the Dalton schools are not because of mm -hmm. the CPS students. You know, no, that is, that uh, is I think it's a very important answer, thing to say. That right, is right. a wrong answer. Right, right. Um, but I, I think that they are inheriting a legacy of disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are just arriving at a time when the schools are hollowed out. Um, and and what, what they are getting is, you know, below the standard of what many Americans expect from their public schools. Right. And we talked to many, many students that talked about um, just not having teachers in class or having a substitute mm -hmm. um, for their Spanish class all semester. And if you sit in, 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 with a substitute for a day, if you're a kid, I mean, you know what that day is going to be like. You might watch a movie. Right. The teacher might be a little bit checked out. They might assign you to you know, do some coloring or something like that. But it's not the education that you're going to get with a teacher that's there every single day that you know. And, and you see how shaky the whole thing is. I mean, you see this a lot in education reporting, but there's a core of invested families, often homeowners, often middle class or upper that kind of maintain a school or a school district. I'm not an education reporter, but I, I feel like that's generally what I've been able to, to learn. And then, you know, maybe some kids come in, some, some families start renting in Dalton. They want to send their kids to a better school. They want just the same thing as every parent. But then homeowners with means maybe perceive a decline. Maybe it's real. Maybe it's something they just start to feel. And then they move if mm -hmm. they can. And then there's another family gone that was kind of a anchor family right. that, that you know, had been in the district that didn't, and, and suddenly you feel the whole, it's like a Jenga, you, like the whole thing starts to collapse yeah, yeah. very quickly. It all happens faster than, slow and then very fast. And let's not forget that the real culprit in this is the whole uh, property tax system and the fact that our entire education structure is right. built on property taxes. So even a city as wealthy as Chicago can't afford to provide good education for all of its students, and that's, I mean, your station and your organization have covered this extensively, and we keep talking about it. But imagine that you're a tiny little town with a couple of schools, and the only source you have is, is mm -hmm. property taxes because we're Illinois and we're number 
49 or whatever we are in state support. So the state educated, they don't have a, 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 a main line of money coming in from Springfield. No, it's so they're brutal. stuck. I mean, we talked to a superintendent who's, who said, I can't even recruit teachers because there's not an easy way to get here to the Dalton area on public transportation. There's that too, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's just so yeah. many, like, I mean, I mean, I can't even imagine being a superintendent of that dis of one of the districts there and yeah. looking out and being like, how do I start right. to right. deal with all right. of these issues? I mean, you're kind of just trying to stay above water, making sure the kids aren't hungry, mm -hmm. you know, which yeah. they are. And you talk about Chicago public schools and in CPS, there are some, um, you know, not so great schools, but there are also some of the best in the state, yeah. if not yeah. the nation, right? So there, there is this disparity there, um, but there, there are some schools on the high end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, that's there for, for many reasons, but in Dalton, it's just not there because they're reliant on this diminished tax base. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of empty storefronts. And uh, we spoke to David Orr, and he was telling us just about how broken this taxing system is. I mean, this is a taxing system that punishes the poorest in society mm -hmm. and rewards mm -hmm. the wealthiest. Mm -hmm. And you can see that dynamic at play because in public the laws. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just to connect some dots here, Dalton taxes are extremely high to deal with like what, what Casey's talking about. Mm -hmm. When taxes are high, homeowners often can't pay their taxes. Right. That results in a tax sale when their taxes are sold to an investment company yeah. who can take their house, which is what happened to Courtney Jones. And the longer you spend in this community, at least for us, I mean, you start to see how these things are part of a, a cycle. I mean, they're all sort of connected. They're not discrete problems mm -hmm. e existing in isolation mm -hmm. from each other. And it makes it, it, it made it a, it was a real challenge for us to figure out how to write about these issues because they, it's like you can't bring up one without the next one right, without right. the next one. You know, I've been I've been curious for so long about the whole tax scavenger thing, which which to me seems like legalized predation. I mean, I, I just simply don't understand how it can exist. Well, you, you, well, go ahead. It's got sort of a sort of an interesting and, and dark history here in Chicago. Um, in the '60s, in the in the '60s and '70s, there was this guy. There's a recent academic piece on this, who sort of kickstarted this uh, tax lien sale purchasing. A, a white guy who was buying up homes, basically taking homes out from under black homeowners in areas that he thought he could gentrify. Jesse Jackson got involved. There was a Rainbow Push campaign. Hmm. This guy was, for a while, um, I believe, uh, was the head ethicist for the either the Chicago Bar, Chicago Bar Association or the Illinois Bar Association. I mean, he was a he was sort of a big player. Wow. Um, and there was this whole push to reform the laws. And they, they stopped it, and people just stopped talking about it then. But it's been around for a really long time. And these days, lots of local governments rely on it to, to get the money they need to pay their bills. But, you know, many people say it ends up punishing the most vulnerable. Because, because the winner in the end is the, is the local government because they get the taxes. Yeah, they, well, they get them one way or the other. The winner, you could argue, is the investor who well, reaps that, right. fees. Right. Uh, interest right. and and perhaps takes a deed. Yeah, and there are companies that are doing this that are not just like local Chicago operations. I mean, they are national companies. They are equity firms that that do this, and then they um, you know they package them into securities. And it's and, amazing. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, um, and so the worse your the worse your municipality is off the more attractive you are to people who want to come in and make a buck off of your off of your suffering basically right i mean that's that's what we're saying here oh that's true that's true because in these towns um you know people can't afford their houses their houses are cheap and often um the stock is not that bad like in dalton there there's hundreds of right. abandoned houses mm -hmm. Uh, and some are, are worse off than others. But there are homes that you look at them, and you know, while no one's living in them, you know, they look like they could be a steal mm -hmm. um, if you, you spend some money on them. And I think they're very, very attractive for these, um, these tax firms. And the towns, they need that revenue. Right. I mean, it, it, we're talking about a town like Dalton where um, you know, there's only three police officers and a supervisor for a shift sometimes, a few times a month. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have that money to pay their police officers, mm -hmm. I mean, the whole thing is on the verge of collapse. Yeah, the, the, I was talking to the director of the National Tax Lien Association, which is the There's a National people. Tax Lien Association? Yeah, like most of this stuff happens huh. at a local level, so it's kind of hard to track. 
But I was asking him, you know, how's business? And he said, <laughs> uh, he said their membership has doubled in yeah. the last five years. Good for them. More than doubled in the last five years. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of th there's a lot of people involved in this. It's it's a little hard to peel back the layers on, but once you start looking at it, it's pretty so interesting. So I've often wondered why couldn't a well-intended rich person or or civic-minded company get into the tax lien business as a not-for-profit? To just have to basically be a bank to help people through, and then and then, you know, as, 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 as without uh, charging interest on returning the loans. Why can't? Why couldn't that happen? Well, just just here's an interesting tidbit. Uh, there is a Cook County Indemnity Fund, which is something that you can apply for, that Courtney Jones applied for. Saying, oh, that's right. That's right. Saying, that's hey, right. I I, yeah. uh, I need some help. I lost my home. Yeah, yeah. Jones, according to I talked to him, I think a week or two ago, and his lawyer is set to get a payment from that company and then add some of his own money and give that money right back to the tax lien investor in return for his house. So in a sense, these companies are kind of tied into the public help uh, that's being provided and kind of capitalizing on that as well. They say, hey, we took your house. Go ahead and ask the government for money. Ask the taxpayers for money. Give it back to us. Give back your house. And he got like $45,000 or something from the Cook County Indemnity Fund that yeah. he just passed over to this yeah. company. Yeah. And, it's you know, a smart move for them. A little wrinkle about this is this company that bought his taxes um, after he failed to do so in the most recent tax sale, they didn't pay him. So the whole process <laughs> kind of starts over again. Yeah. We were trying to trace the history of this <laughs> stuff, and it's like your taxes have been sold, you know, a couple of times. But in every case, <clears throat> the municipality pretty much always gets their money. Well, that's, yeah, the t when the tax sale's made, right. the, the company pays Cook County, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Cook County gets, gets the money, and Dalton gets the money. But, you know, I was talking to one expert for a piece that I'll have on National Public Radio about this hopefully soon, who said, like, he used the metaphor of it's like, it's like going to the ATM uh, to, like, make your car payment. Basically, you get some quick cash, but you give up a lot. You give up, you know, you give up any interest that the, the government could charge, and you also... Mm -hmm. You end up sending your citizen often into a bit of a tailspin. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned, you know, this real estate market. And, and one of the things that we saw is it just created this kind of upside down market for investors. Yeah. Where people yeah. see all these cheap properties and they'll right. rush in and scoop them up. Right. I mean, there is a Republican congressman, Adam Kinzinger, out of yeah. Shanahan. Which now is former, way I out think, there. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, Kinzinger, um, you know, he bought two homes in Dalton. Mm -hmm. um, and I, we saw that there is a rise of out-of-state companies that own homes in Dalton that has increased, you know, within the past couple of decades by more than 500%. Mm -hmm. So there's all these out-of-state firms that see right. these cheap properties, even with these enormous taxes, that'll come in and scoop them up, and then they'll rent them out, and they'll get their payments. And, and you also point out something that hadn't occurred to me before, is that basically the rents don't change. The rents don't go down. The rents just get, you know, you, that, that's like a kind of a guarantee. So you could pick up a house for 70000 bucks. Maybe you have to pay off a few tens of thousands of, of back taxes on it. You invest, you, you, you're in for $100,000. You rent that house for I don't know two thousand dollars a month or whatever it is, and and in a couple of years you're you're paid off and you're you're just in gravy. And that's the business right there. Yeah. I mean that's what people are doing. They're getting these houses and they're renting them out and they are just collecting that money that comes in. You know whether or not they keep up their property. Well, that's it, and and uh, and, and that's also issue. that's also part of the that's part of the uh, the equation too. You you figure that out. It's like this house is uh, in pretty good shape. I could probably milk this house for 15 years before it's just completely uninhabitable, and in that time I'll have earned twice what I put into it, and I'll walk away. And there's been an explosion in, in towns like Dalton and Cal City um, with uh, like like Section Eight Section yeah. Eight housing vouchers. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because that. For many people, it is giving them, you know, uh, like a lifeline that they could do with this house right, that they right, owned. Right. And so they move away, but they keep the house. And then they will get that money every month, mm -hmm. you know, from the federal government. And so there are these incredibly poor towns like Dalton that just have um, just these incredibly large percentages of people living on housing vouchers. It's, it's just an amazing story, and that's, that's why I just had to have you guys here, because it, it's just one of the, as somebody who's been like following this stuff all my life, uh, 
this is a story that's got it all. Yeah. Everything is in this bowl, you know? It's just everything that can possibly go wrong. <laughs> and yet, like you say, for some people, it's, uh, you know, it's a windfall. It's a good way to make a living. All right, well, anyway, I, I think, I, I thought we would maybe end with um, the, uh, this uh, statement again, uh, and I, I, I forgot who it was, but you'll remember it. Um, they're not all areas of opportunity. Just moving to the suburbs doesn't mean you've made it to opportunity. That vision of upward mobility is a thing of the past with steady paychecks harder to come by, local tax bases sapped and a shaken community laid vulnerable to plunging home values, real estate scavengers, political carpetbaggers, crime is up, schools are struggling, the town can't pay its water bill, the focus is Dalton, but it's just as easily Riverdale, Harvey, Dixmore, Posen, Cal Calumet City and plenty of other nearby suburbs that were once powered by steel and other industry, but over time slowly coalesced into a broad swath of economic distress. Thanks a lot for bumming us all out, you guys. <laughs> well, thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, so, I mean, it's always the, 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 the stupidest question that somebody like me can ask at a time like this is, is there hope? Is there a reason for optimism? Will, will, this, will this get better? I would say that there was not much hope when we were reporting. My editor often asked, well, can we find some hope here? But there's, <laughs> there's a little. I mean, we met a woman um, who, who, who works actually in housing, helping people get into affordable homes in Dalton. She lives in Dalton. She got you know, upset by what she saw with the BP Capital Company coming in and uh, trying, you know, offering its version of how to fix up these homes. And she started a little bit of community organizing, trying to get people who live in the village area together to just even start to invest at all in the villages, um, in, in, in trying to figure out the village's problems. But I'd say more broadly, the response we've gotten to the story, I guess says to me that people care about this and are looking for a way to, to care, maybe in a more direct way, maybe yeah. even get involved. Because there's so many people in this region and across the country that have connections to this kind of community and are worried about them, mm -hmm. you know? So I'd like to think that, that uh, that there's not all hope is lost, that, yeah. pe that people are invested in these communities in, in a variety of ways and are open to figuring out ways to, to, to bring them, you know, to revitalize them. And, and on a, a personal level, we interviewed this woman named uh, Sabrina Peden, who was a social worker out in the elementary school, mm -hmm. and she's been there for 20 years. And I kind of thought of her as like the moral force of the story. I mean, because she is in these schools and she's dealing with these enormous problems and she's coming every day and you could tell that she loves her job and she loves helping these children. And I, I think that as long as there are people like that that are working in any community, there's always hope. And one other final thought is, is what about consolidation? What if, what if this entire region all just kind of jams together and becomes one really large municipality? It would have a voice in Springfield, wouldn't it? It would, it would, it would have more of a, it would, it would just have more political clout, I would think. You would think that, but for that, in order for that to happen, people would have to give up their little fiefdoms, and people are unwilling to do that. I mean, years ago, I wrote this story about, it was about the Robbins Police Department, mm -hmm. um, you know, this town that has no money, and the police department is all screwed up. It's been screwed up for, for yeah. decades, yeah. and Sheriff Tom Dart wanted to take it over, mm -hmm. and they said no. Mm -hmm. So despite this, like, little, uh, you know, thing, this little de police department they had with all these problems, yeah, yeah. they were like, we're not going to do this because we have our police department and it is a source of problems. And it's our police but, department. But I think that's, I think it takes citizens of these places who have voting power getting involved and yeah, saying, look, yeah. this village board and this mayor are completely dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. They haven't accomplished anything. All mm -hmm. they do is squabble with each other right. and uh, find ways to attack each other. Enough is enough. We deserve better. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's like the big political question across the country. How do you get people who have stake mm -hmm. but haven't been involved yeah. to get involved? I don't mm -hmm. know the answer, but yeah. I do know that yeah. it would take, you know, using our constitutional mechanisms to, to force some change. Because these, these leaders aren't going to do it. Well, they're the not going to do it. Not, that's not that's for opinion. sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, guys, thank you so much. I, I, I really enjoyed talking with you, and I enjoyed your, 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 your work. Uh, Casey Toner, BGA, you, you did, I guess, you did more of the written work, and, and Miles Bryan, WBEZ, you did more of the audio work, and uh, both of them are really worth uh, 
So you're at WBEZ.org? Yeah, if you go to interactive.wbez.org slash Dalton slash, you should get to the home. <laughs> oh, sure, okay. Well, or but, just uh, Google WBEZ yeah, Dalton. Yeah, yeah, WBEZ Dalton, that's yeah, the thing to that's do. What that's what, what I've been doing. Okay. And, uh, and BGA Dalton, and you yeah, get we're it. we're at bettergov.org. Use the Googles. They're, the they're, Googles. they're faster and easier. <laughs> yeah. What was that? Interactive what? <laughs> 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 Wait, let me write that down. <laughs> I'm going to okay. sign. Okay, guys, thanks again. Thank and good luck and, and keep up the good work, okay? Right. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis, and thank you very much for uh, doing that. We're going to kind of carry this conversation on next week because um, we're going to be talking about the Battle of Lincoln Park, uh, and that is a uh, really interesting conversation with Daniel K. Hertz. Uh, it's in many ways, it's kind of the same conversation, but it's just in an alternate universe. And, um, you know, we're, we're interested in these things and municipalities and how they work. And uh, you should be, too. So we'll uh, see you next week again. Remember, you can watch all of our shows by going to this address right here. That's our archive of Chicago Newsroom, about eight years of them now. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye for now.